Thank you. Got it. Hello. This is a big group. I, I'm not used to this. I'm used to like 12 people showing up for these talks or something. Um, welcome, everyone. It's, it's really interesting to see that, um, when people introducing themselves and putting their name in the, um, the location in there and seeing that it's quite widespread, isn't it? It's lovely. This is the joy of, of, um, of the world at the moment, is that being able to connect with people all over the place. Um, yeah, Naked Scrum, someone reminded me to wear clothes. So it's, uh, I am doing that. I'm doing that. <laughs> clothes all over, trousers too. Um, yeah, it's about, um, what is this? This talk's really about, you know, we, <laughs> Agile and Scrum, it gets very really overloaded, doesn't it? We pile, we pile stuff on top. And the essence of um, the Agile Manifesto, when it was um, first touted, uh, was really about taking stuff away, is removing all of the things we didn't need anymore. And that's how it started. And then we started putting more and more stuff back on. So I thought it'd be interesting to sort of look at stripping away some of this other extras that we've been putting on there and to focus specifically on Scrum, because this is a Scrum, well, it was, it's, it's not anymore apparently, but it was a Scrum group to start with. It's expanded out, which is fine. Um, and the work that I do is mostly, mostly around that. So um, I thought we'd look at that. Um, we're going to use, I, I, we won't really have time for breakouts. And it's so massive, it's going to just be too hard to manage that. So but I will get you to interact through the chat window, which is um, probably going to mean stuff moving by pretty quickly. But I'd like to start with thinking about um, when you're practicing Scrum in your organization or you hear about people practicing Scrum, what are some of the um, terms that you hear people use that actually have nothing to do with Scrum and people just sort of assume it does. Uh, if you could just start typing those in the window, in the chat window, it'd be quite interesting to see. There we go, look, they're flying by user stories, story points, velocity, process, estimation, 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 story point, velocity, yeah, the, all of these things. Now someone's typed retrospectives, so that's a curious one, but we'll look at that in a minute. It will fix everything, <laughs> product manager. Product manager, project manager, burn down, yeah, all of these things. Um, <laughs> wow. of fluff. Some of these things are actually part of Scrum, aren't they? Like Scrum is a framework, so framework is, I would say, is there. Um, but maybe it doesn't have to be. Look at, let's look at all the superfluous stuff that, perhaps the stuff that's not mentioned in the Scrum guide. Um, itself, so it doesn't. It doesn't say we shouldn't have documentation with some guy. That's true. Um, it doesn't mention user stories or epics. Um, uh, it doesn't mention velocity. It doesn't mention story points. It doesn't mention um, burn downs, release trains, all of those kind of things. <clears throat> it, it doesn't say twice the value in half the time. Okay, so lots of stuff, right? So lots of stuff that. We hear people talking about, and um, uh, when they when they think they're talking about Scrum and they're talking about all this extra stuff, it's not to say we should never have any of that, um, but it does make us stop and think: Is it necessary? You know, if the Scrum guide doesn't see fit to talk about it, perhaps we we should um, question whether there's value in sitting down and having discussions around story points. It's been added on much later. Um, <clears throat> Scrum does mention estimation, though. Um, what does it say about estimation? It says that um, product backlog items need to be estimated before they're executed in the sprint. That's all it says. It doesn't say anything about how to do that. It basically means that the question really is, um, can we get the work completed on this item in the sprint? Yes or no? That's an estimation. And if the answer is no, you don't accept it in the sprint. You find a way to break it down smaller, simplify it in some way. So we have a lot of stuff that is, is added on. But then we, got this, we got, then we got Scrum itself, we got the Scrum Guide, and it uses language, doesn't it, that uh, perhaps alienates some people, um, it becomes a bit domain specific. We talk about sprints. Now, if you haven't learned what we mean when we say sprint, it's a bit confusing, because a sprint to most people is to run really, really fast for a short period of time. Uh, is that what we mean when we're doing Scrum? I don't think so. I don't think it's about going fast. Um, so we use language and we've twisted these words and, and applied them in, uh, in these different places. 
So let's look at some of those terms. So we've got um, product owner. Don't we use product owner now? We don't use product manager anymore. Uh, we have, we've introduced this idea of scrum master, which is completely alien to most organizations. Um, and I'm not saying any of this is bad, by the way. I'm just pointing out that, you know, these, these, this is how it is. Uh, I have my own thoughts about these terms. And personally, I love the term Scrum Master. I know that some people take issue with it, but I like it because I find it confrontational. Um, so I think that, you know, there's some value in it. But it's a term that is meaningless to people unless you've had some reading and some knowledge of it. It's not intuitive. Put it that way. So we use the, yeah, we use the term sprint. Um, and then we have our meetings. That we, we have reviews, we have retrospectives. And our retro these are in the Scrum Guide, of course, but um, they're very specific to Scrum. And do people do retrospectives in other places? They, have, they do things like um, you know, they, uh, end of project meetings. Uh, what do they call them? Can't think, my mind's blanking on that one. Um, oh, thank you, thank you. That's the, that's the awful word, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's no post-mortems in Scrum. And actually people start using that too. I've heard people say, we're gonna do the end of sprint post-mortem. I said, no, you're not gonna do that. That's not really what we do. Um, post-mortem to happen when something dies, right? But if you're iterating, nothing's ended, it's continuous. So you're just reflecting, it's just a reflection. That's a term people are familiar with, by the way, reflect, to reflect on what you've done rather than have a retrospective. It's a bit loaded. Uh, and then we have daily scrums, you know, which again is an introduced term. So there's a lot of language in there that um, is, it has a purpose. All domain specific language has a purpose. It, it, you know, we're, we're trying to clarify with using those terms, but what happens is it, it, it can also alienate people. So we need a bit of caution around that. So <clears throat> I want to just talk about um, creative work in general, right? So software development is creative work. It's not manufacturing. We don't make something and repeatedly make the same thing over and over again. Each time we write a bit of software, we're making something completely new that's never existed before. The closest you might get to any kind of repetition is to rebuild a system that is already built. Um, but one would assume you're rebuilding it better and with more capability and less rubbish. Right? So you're still making essentially something new. So we're in the act of creation every time we do the sort of work that we do. So there's other kind of creative work in the world. And we, you know, so we, we've got a, the metaphor we use for software is engineering. So I don't think it's that accurate. I'm not sure it's the right metaphor, but it is a metaphor, you know, because it isn't really engineering what we're doing. Engineering is, I don't know, designing and building bridges, perhaps, or buildings and uh, big structures like that. Um, you know, there's other kinds of engineering, of course, but software is um, more of a craft than it is about an engineering discipline, I reckon. Uh, we could argue that, but, um, and I think that there's elements of software development that is, you know, it has, requires an engineering mindset, perhaps. Um, but it requires it requires more of an artist mindset, I reckon. Um, so it's a creative. Let's look at it as creative work. It certainly isn't manufacturing work. It's certainly not rep repeating work. It's, and it's certainly not mechanical because we can't predict it. See, this is the this is the big problem we had. You know, with engineering an engineering discipline, we want to be able to predict the end result. If we're building a bridge. Um, we want to be able to predict that it's going to take the weight of all of the lorries and cars that are going to cross it. And we want to have some ability to know. We have to know that. We can't just kind of go, well, maybe it will, maybe it won't. Maybe we'll change our minds halfway through building this bridge. You absolutely can't do that. But you can absolutely do that with when you're building software products. Um, and not only can you, you ought to. Um, because the world is changing quite quickly around people's needs in the information age. And so we want to be able to adapt as we go. So that's why I see it's not quite engineering. It, it is more like um, um, tailor making for something. You know, you're, um, imagine you're making a, 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 an item of clothing, a suit, and you're being quite slow about it. And in the meantime, they put on weight. Well, you're going to have to adapt your pattern, to make it fit, aren't you? otherwise it's going to be kind of useless. So um, building software is a bit more like that. It's an act of creation. And, and I use that term quite lightly. You know, we are all, I'm not 
I'm not using it to say, well, some of us are creative and some are not. And I really dislike the, the use of the term creatives, the noun creatives inside some of the organizations we're working, as if it only applies to people who sit doing drawings or making user interfaces or something. It applies to anyone, all of us, we're all creative. Um, and just to think about, you know, it's acts of creation, let's just think about cooking for a moment, because most of us cook in one way or another. And um, cooking is a creative act, isn't it? Because you're making something that doesn't exist, you're creating something that isn't currently there. And you're pulling together different ingredients um, and uh, different techniques in, or, in order to feed yourself. And you want to feed yourself with food that tastes good. So you're giving it a bit of thought. Um, so when we're cooking, what, are we, what we're doing is we're in the process of making. So I'm going to introduce three words that I think captures the entirety of the Scrum process. The first one is this, written on cards even, here we are, make. That's what we do, we make stuff, right? We make, we build software, um, we cook food, um, we make pictures perhaps, you know, and we get into um, various acts of creation throughout the day. I would say even things like cleaning the house or, or, or you know, um, decorating your home, um, pruning the hedge. These are all acts of creation. You're making something that isn't there before. You're making something better that is there. Uh, you're doing an improvement. You're doing versioning, perhaps you're doing versioning. So they're all acts of creation. So we are essentially in this, in this act of, of making things. So when you're cooking a meal, you're making, but you're not just making, right? If you just cooked and um, put everything together, cooked it and ate it, um, there's a danger in that, isn't there? It's a danger that it might not taste very good, that you've done it wrong, you've missed a bit. And um, so what we tend to do is we pause in our act of making the food and we taste the food. We taste, or we might ask someone else to taste the food, someone who's standing by nearby, someone in the family who is also going to eat with us, who might ask them to taste the food. So what we're doing when we do that is we're doing this. We're aligning. Now, alignment is something that gets lost a little bit in a, in a traditional way of working because of this idea of wanting to get it right and planning it all up front. And if only we get the requirements right and the plan right and the architecture right, or get the product right. And so we, we spend more time, when things go wrong in a traditional way of working, we, we usually blame uh, lack of upfront time. I've heard this in a number of postmortems. I have actually been to postmortems in the past. And they talk about, well, we didn't spend enough time getting the requirements right. All right. So we now spend more time getting the requirements right. And it still doesn't work, of course, because of the changes that need to happen. Um, so we don't do enough alignment en route as we go. And it is like kind of just cooking and hoping for the best, you know, not being able to taste the food you make. So we need to have alignment. What Scrum does is it has these four points throughout the um, working period, which Scrum calls a sprint, but you might just call a time box, or you might just call a week, or you might just call it a fortnight, or you might call it two weeks, or you might call it a month. It's a block of time. Um, it doesn't have to be called a sprint, but that's what we call it in Scrum. Um, and it has these four, these four meetings, these four moments, these four conversations that occur. At the beginning, we meet to align with our customers about what it is they want and what it is we think we can make in the time that we've got. At the end, we come back to our customers and we say we align with them on what we have made to make sure that what we have made is exactly what they wanted us to make or potentially better than what they wanted us to make. If it isn't, uh, then we learn something from it. Then we have another kind of alignment meeting between ourselves to align on how well we work together, to stop working for a moment so we can reflect on the work itself. But while we're working, it's quite hard to reflect on the work. So we need a bit of a pause, a bit of a stillness to do that. So we're aligning with each other. Then we've got the fourth meeting, which is happening even more frequently than that. And it happens every day in Scrum. Uh, and in Scrum, we call it the daily Scrum, but it's basically a check-in with your teammates. Um, it's like tasting the food. All right, making sure that what we've made is um, suited to the palette and is going in the direction we want it to go in. 
So we've got these alignment meetings in Scrum. So we, we're, and in between our alignment meetings, whether they're with each other or whether they're with the customer, we're getting on with the process of making the thing. So that's pretty much what we do. And I'm gonna share a picture, not really a picture, words on a, on a screen. Um, I'm not gonna share my screen. I'm just gonna put a link in the chat window for that. And if you click on that, you'll see the image um, of the two words, make and align. I call that the heart of the creative process. So no matter what the process is, whether you're building software, cooking food, um, painting a picture, doing your garden, make, knitting a scarf, um, you're doing this. You're doing both of these things. You're doing both of these things repeatedly uh, over and over again. So you've got this, you know, you've got this sense of at one point where we're making and then we're aligning and then we're making and then we're aligning and then we're going back and making some more and then we're going. And it has that kind of ongoing iterative feel to it. We're doing one after the other. We're never just doing them once. We're doing them over and over again. And you can think of um, when we're cooking a meal, we're just cooking for ourselves or our partner. It's, it's kind of um, low key, isn't it? We don't have to worry too much about it. Um, and if we um, enjoy painting and we're painting a picture for ourselves, there's no customer. We're, we are our own customers in these, in these scenarios. And, um, but our act of alignment, perhaps even if we're completely solo and we're painting, if I was to paint a picture, I've got an idea in my head of what I want it to look like. Uh, and then um, and that's my first alignment. I'm aligning, uh, I'm aligning myself with my vision. And then I start to draw or paint. And um, frequently I have to step back from the picture and hold it up and look at it or step away from the canvas and decide if it's going towards the thing that I think it ought to be. So does it match my vision? And if it, if it does, then I go back to it and I continue working on it. If it doesn't, I might need to rethink something. I might need to go back and erase things or start again uh, or change my vision. Actually, what I'm making is more interesting than what I thought I was going to make. Maybe I'll turn this into an abstract. Yeah, so I get to reassess things and I get that through the alignment. So I'm aligning just with myself at that point. But when we start bringing other people into it, like I'm painting a picture for somebody and they've commissioned me or um, we're cooking a meal and inviting some guests over. Um, then it changes it a little bit, right? So um, we, we have to do this other thing, which is to interact with our customers as well. So we're not just doing it for ourselves. So let's just expand this out a bit. And when we're working um, with other people, we, we, we need a few more elements in there. And of course, Scrum is set up to do software development work for users and for customers. So we always have customers when we're doing Scrum. We're not just doing it for ourselves. Um, but let's look at, like, imagine that you're cooking a meal um, for some friends. You've got some friends coming over and you and your partner um, or you and your kids or you and your mum, uh, you're going to prepare a meal for your guests who are coming over. So before you start cooking, you're probably going to think about what you're going to cook. Right. This is not a case of just opening the fridge and seeing what's there and opening up a, you know, a tin of beans or something like that so you can quickly feed yourself. This is making something a bit nicer. Um, so you have a conversation with each other about what should we cook and what are the limitations? You know, maybe your guests have um, some dietary restrictions or something like that. Anyway, so when you're thinking about what you're going to cook, you're going to go to your backlog. What is a backlog? It's a funny word in Scrum, isn't it? It's not one of those funny words. It, a backlog is all the things we could possibly do for this product, all the things we might do. Uh, and almost certainly not all the things we're going to do, just all the things that we potentially could do. Um, so we go to our backlog, which is our collection of cookery books. Maybe we just have one, one cookery book. And it's got all the recipes that you are familiar with and you enjoy cooking. And um, so you pull out your recipe book and you flip through it and you prioritize. Well, you look at the things that you, you go, we can't do these ones because they've got this particular dietary restriction so that eliminates all that stuff. Um, what are we going to commit to for this dinner party that we're going to? Have? Well, you know, we've got five people coming over plus us at seven people. Um, let's think about what coming. We want three courses for this meal. We want some side dishes, and so you you gradually kind of 
figure out what your um, what your sprint plan is going to be. The sprint goal, of course, is to cook the meal. We don't call it a sprint goal when we're cooking dinner for our friends, though, do we? We just say we're going to cook dinner. We call it dinner, not not sprint goal. And um, but it is that's it's exactly the same thing. So we've made a determination. We've chosen some items. We've picked them for various. We prioritise them for various reasons. It might be the ingredients we have, the ingredients that are available at this time of year, the ones that um, don't get disturbed by people's restrictions. And so we prioritise and we've made some choices. Um, so we pulled these out. The other interesting thing about a cookery book, by the way, um, which is really important when we think about backlogs, is um, when we go through a cookery book, we don't read everything. We don't read the whole recipe for every single item in the book, do we? We read the title and we look at the picture. And that's enough, right? We flip, we flip through. Why even could just go to the index, in fact? Um, but if we're flipping through the book, we're looking, you know, the pictures jump out at us. We say, oh, well, ooh, that looks good. I want to make that. Or, or the name is intriguing or something like that. It's only when we make a decision on which of these things we're going to do, then we start digging down into the detail, right? This is a bit like um, taking your user story, even though we don't have those in Scrum, taking our product backlog item and... Um, thinking, okay, we want to build this. How are we going to build it? What do we need to do? And we start breaking it down into tasks. And that's helping us to form our sprint backlog. Um, so now we start reading the recipe. And as we're reading it, we might realize, no, we can't do that because we're never going to get hold of that particular ingredient. Is there a substitute we could use? No, not really. So let's dump that one and try something else. So the act of kind of like going into a bit more detail helps to, also helps the prioritization process of what we're going to choose. So now we've got our... Um, We've got our shrimp backlog. We've got our list of um, recipes that we're going to cook. And we've started to break them down and figuring out what we need to buy, how we're going to cook it, who's doing what bit of work. Uh, and then we start doing the work. So um, very natural, isn't it? I mean, and, and again, we're not, we're not talking about product backlogs. We're not talking about sprint goals. We're saying, get out the recipe book. Let's see what we're going to cook. This is what our meal is going to be. And uh, we start working on it while we're working on it. We're doing this thing of tasting, right? Checking, making sure that things are right. Um, asking for help from each other. And uh, can you run to the shop? We've, I've forgotten to get the tomatoes. Can you run to the shop and get the tomatoes? Right? So we're checking in, making sure that we get what we need. Uh, we don't call that a daily scrum. Um, we don't call it a scrum at all. We, we, just, um, we just have conversations. Right? We have conversations with the people who are doing the work with us so we can get the work done more effectively and make sure that um, each person's needs are met. And the product that we're about to, that we're making the process of making uh, is gonna get done on time for the, for the dinner party. Um, so then we, we get it done, all goes well, there's guests come over and uh, we put the food on the table, which I suppose is a little bit like a product review, right? You're serving up the thing that you made um, and you're serving it up and it's in accordance with the um, dietary requirements that they've expressed. And uh, they eat it. And while they're eating it, you will probably get some feedback. You might not get verbal feedback, but you might make a face, or they might make a noise, mm, that's really good. Or they might just not eat something, which is telling. Right? So you're getting some feedback from it. At the end of the dinner party, when you're doing the dishes and you know clearing the table and stuff, after all the guests have gone home, you and your partner are probably going to have a conversation about, well, how did that go? What did you think? How was that? Was that dish the way we wanted it to be? And no one ate that. Did you notice that? Maybe we shouldn't cook that again, right? So we get process improvement from that from that conversation at the end there. And in Scrum, we call that a retrospective, but I don't call that a retrospective when me and my wife are doing the washing up. Actually, it's usually me that's doing the washing up, but um, nevertheless, um, we don't call that a retrospective. But we do have a conversation about how we're going to do it differently next time. Right? So, so the point is, it's all there, isn't it? You know, if it's, And this is just cooking dinner, right? So you think about all of the other creative things you do in your life and the, the learning, a learning journey is a creative journey you're probably finding that you're going to be um, doing many of those same things in that. So the missing word out of the three words, of course, is, um, is that one, right? When we're working with, uh, in a business setting, or we have customers or people we have to um, satisfy in some way, we have to release the thing that we're making. And we get feedback on the release, right? So we get feedback as we go. We get feedback on the release. So that first picture I shared with you 
um, it's just showing it's showing the heart of the creative process. But if you expand that out to a, into a business model um, with that extra word in it, look like this. Make a line release. So if you look at that picture, it doesn't look completely unlike a scrum diagram, does it? You've got a smaller feedback loop inside a larger feedback loop. So if you look at, I don't know, any of the scrum diagrams, if you did a search for scrum diagram through images, they look a little bit like that. You've got this small circle, a small loop inside a big loop. And um, that's the core of scrum, essentially. That, that's what it is. And um, the other stuff that Scrum says we should do, like plan and review and um, retrospect and do daily check-ins, that's all quite a natural process. We're doing those things anyway all the time. So there's nothing strange about it. There's nothing weird about it. All right? uh, and it's, it's curious to me when I hear people saying things like, well, why do we have to do retrospectives? Why do we have to do planning? Can't we just get on? Yeah, you can not plan. You could just start cooking and with what's in the house. And it might be all right. You know, it might be, who knows, but it might, it's unlikely to be all right every time. It might be all right from time to time. And no, you don't have to talk about afterwards how it went, um, but you might then make the same mistake again if you don't have a conversation about it. So the question really is not so much, yeah, you can not do those things, but why would you want to not do those things? Because when do you not do those things in other parts of your life? You probably do those things. You're not even thinking about the fact that you're doing those things. Given that we have a bit of time, I'm going to ask you to do one more thing. Um, here's another picture, which is pretty much the same picture as the one I just shared, but um, using notation rather than drawings on it. So you can do a sort of pseudo code notation of this. Um, of this simple process of Scrum. Make a line. So if you're familiar with this kind of notation, you'll know what those symbols mean. Um, they mean exactly what they what I showed in the previous picture, basically, with the red arrows. What I'm curious about um, in this talk, and I'm glad that it went fairly swiftly, so we do have time for this. Um, and J Jamie, I need your help on this, because I want to do a, a bit of a breakout here. Um, and if you're recording it, we can keep one breakout group in the main, in the main, or you can join a breakout group. And I think the recording follows you. So can you set up groups of about five? I can do that. Thank you. And you'll be in one of them. If you can put yourself in one and then the recording will follow you. So that room will be recorded. It will be about 13 to 14 participants per room. I'm going to go. No, can you make smaller rooms? So groups of groups of about um, five to six. Okay. All right. I. So you you need to do like fourteen rooms, I suppose, and thirteen rooms. Okay, I have that ready. Right. I'll so what, what, what right. are you going to do in there? Um, what I want you to do now is I gave you this example of of cooking dinner. Um, I want you to come up with some examples of your own of creative things you do. And um, the creative things you do, um, don't get too caught up on that word. Like I said, I've given you know, the cooking thing because it's something we all do. Um, spring cleaning the house is, is pretty creative, I think. Um, raising children, that's quite a big creative thing you do that lasts many years, so your sprints are quite long when you're doing that. Um, so you know, use your imagination, learning a new language, attending classes, each class is a sprint. It's that kind of idea. What's your what's your planning? What's your reflection on that? So just play around with that idea and um, support each other in kind of like filling in the gaps of each of these processes. And if we can do that for about uh, 10 minutes or so, and then um, we can come back, and, you know, you can share back what what came out of that for yourselves. But, you know, being familiar with the Scrum Guide, as I'm sure many of you are, you're just going to look at the, think about the elements of Scrum. Not the people, we're not so worried about that yet. I might touch on that afterwards though, but it's the artifacts of Scrum, the three artifacts of Scrum and the five events of Scrum that we're looking at here. All right, so you could go ahead and open those rooms, Jamie.
just got their camera. They've just got their, um, uh, they're there, but they're not really there because we had someone in our room who was not non-communicative. So I hope you had someone, at least one person. Um, can we see in the chat window again, just some examples of things that you talked about? So like we talked about home decorate. Choir repetition. Gardening. What is choir repetition, Anita? What is that? Probably the wrong word, sorry. And choir contents where you're repeating beforehand. Uh, so rehearsals. Oh, rehearsals. rehearsals. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, I get it. Weight loss, vacation planning. They're great, these. Planting a garden, preparing for a concert, two very different things. Children's exams. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so preparing your kids to, you know, go and, uh, go and take an exam. These are the goals, aren't they? These are like the, the small goals along the way. This, this you know, passing a particular test and moving to the next level. We get this with, you know, if, if kids are doing gymnastics or learning the piano or something, we've got these interim goals that we go for. Um, I suppose you could, you know, somebody might think of those as milestones, but I think of them as achievements. You know, they're finished things. Uh, milestones are steps on the way to something. But a sprint goal is actually a completion in itself. And, and we know it is because the way we try to set this up is like we always have to ask the question in Scrum. What if this is the last sprint we ever do on this product? What are we going to deliver that's of value? And we don't, we're not allowed to do anything after that. So we know that every time we finish a sprint, we're delivering something that is incrementally adding to the value of the product that's out there. We're not just doing something that's half finished. And milestones are like halfway points. It's not the same. Right. So passing your particular belt in karate or a particular grade in the piano is an achievement in and of itself. That if you never did any more, you still got that. You got that certificate and you got that ability that has taken you up to that point. So that's the difference between, you know, milestones and um, sprint goals. There's loads of stuff coming in here. I don't know if you're catching it. Weddings <laughs> that only have one sprint. Well, I, yes and no. I mean... <laughs> A wedding is a big piece of work, right? And I think that um, wedding planners probably have um, interim achievements they want to get done. You know, an achievement, of course, you have to have the wedding. They're, they're, so it's it's not like you can only get bits and pieces of the wedding and still call it successful. But a, a completed sprint might be getting all of the bridesmaids' dresses made, or it might be, you know, making choosing and ordering the cake. Of course, everything has to come together in the last moment, doesn't it? But there are interim sprint goals that you could have for that. Um, but yeah, and some people get married multiple times and they probably get find ways to improve that. Usually the people who get married more than once, um, what they learn is not to have such a big wedding because it's very expensive. <laughs> and uh, if it's especially very expensive if, you sp if you're paying back the debt of the wedding longer, <laughs> than, the, longer than the marriage lasts. So there's definitely... <laughs> Definitely some learning in that. Um, yeah, and Jim loves seeing how folks are using Scrum in their day-to-day -day lives. We didn't know we were using Scrum, did we, until we learned about Scrum. And then it's like, oh, I've done this. And people say, you know, I've been doing this all the time. Um, and they have, actually. They actually have been doing this all the time. Um, they're not just trying to pretend that, oh, I know about this, you know, before you did. But they are actually doing this all the time, just not using those terms. Playing rugby, Mark, that's great. Uh, ideal isn't it ideal place <laughs> playing any sport i imagine right and and yes there are how many groups selected gardening i i imagine most of them right in most of the groups but that's one that does come up a lot um i had this um experience of, of someone else doing my gardening work for me so i had the experience here we go i'm gonna talk about roles very briefly i had the experience of being a product owner um, for my own garden, essentially. And my customers were the rest of my family. So I was the sort of um, contact point between the two guys doing the work and the people who had um, needs to be met. You know, it's like an area to play in, an area to sun in, uh, a place to plant flowers, a place to plant herbs, uh, a deck to sit on, all these different requirements. And, and so between myself and the two um, guys who did the work, um, we determined what the what the goal was going to be of all of this, and we checked in along the way. We kept, you know, checking in at the end of it. So basically, a sprint for for us in doing that was a day. They, in, at the end of each day, they would deliver something. They would either build a deck or they would 
um, you know, prepare the soil or they would lay the turf down or they would dig a garden, you know, so each day had some tangible delivery. And um, when they weren't sure about decisions or they ran into a problem, they would call the product owner who might then call the customers out. Say, look, we need to all get our heads together about this because we thought we wanted this and we can't do it. What should we do instead? They would have some ideas about it um, because they're used to doing this kind of stuff. So it's very scrum like the whole the whole thing. And, um, uh, you know, they would be communicating with each other and checking in with each other throughout the day. And at the end of the day, they would call us out and say, yeah, we finished. This is what we've done today and see you tomorrow. You know, anything you want to talk about? Any, is it looking good? Do you like it? See you tomorrow. And then when they drove home, I don't know this for sure, but I imagine that they probably had conversations about how the work went, you know, and what they would do differently the next day, and what, what was successful, what wasn't. And then by the end of it, we had a garden and it took a week, I think, something maybe a little longer. They were the team developers. I was a product owner. Where's the scrum master? Trick question, right? Because there's not one. There's no, there's no scrum master in there. Why not? So why do we need a scrum master? We didn't need a scrum master in that situation because it was an entirely functional relationship. It was a healthy, functional relationship where we all knew what we were doing. But we didn't need anyone to manage it or to, or to hold the space or to... The scrum master role is unnecessary when uh, the environment is completely healthy and people are taking the responsibility for their own work and they want to do the work and they enjoy doing the work, then you don't need Scrum Masters. And the, oh, and the organization as a whole completely supports everything that they do, right? Don't need a Scrum Master. But we don't have organizations like that, do we? We have mostly dysfunctional organizations where people are interrupting you, getting in your way, trying to push the old processes back on you. Right, so a scrum master is essentially um, the person who manages the dysfunction. The more dysfunction you have, the more you need a scrum master, sometimes more than one. Um, but as you create function, as you create, you know, the healthier organization, the need for a scrum master should dissolve uh, and start, start to dissipate. So you get to the situation, you don't need a scrum master when you're cooking dinner for your friends. That would be mad, wouldn't it? Um, now, if you'd started a catering company and you hired lots of people and you were doing, you know, dinners and all kinds of other things, you might need someone to support that work. You might. It depends on how you set it up. If you grew it from small to large and followed, you know, decent principles of um, caring about people and supporting people and giving people the decision making um, responsibilities appropriate to the work they were doing, then you might never need a Scrum Master. But uh, a lot of times when small companies grow large, they think they have to impose process and, and they hire companies like Accenture to come in and help them impose a process. And that's when it all falls apart, basically. And, and you know, so many agile transformations or whatever we call them are coming in to try and fix some of that broken stuff that have been imposed upon people. Whereas if they had stayed with the, you know, the, the mindset of the startup that they began with, they'd probably be doing great. Uh, and some companies are able to do that. There's a lot of companies right, that do what we would ideally look at and say, what a brilliant agile process they've got. And they never heard the word agile because what they're doing is really just what feels natural to them because they've got that kind of creative making mindset. And um, there's not many, though, there's not many companies. And what we're doing, most of us, in the work that we do is coaching and scrum mastering and, and product ownership and, and developing, is we're working in environments that, that doesn't yet support this kind of work. So this is a paradigm shift for many or most organizations, in fact. And what I find useful about this idea of naked scrum is to be able to have conversations with people about what they're already doing that is very like what we're asking them to do. I know it's not like that in the workplace, but it is like that for most other parts of their lives. And if um, we're trying to convince uh, someone in you know, a position of power in an organization, I don't like the idea of convincing, but we're trying to get them to see the value in it. Um, 
telling them about all these other companies that are doing it doesn't work because they 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 talk about well we're not like that we we can't yeah Spotify does this and they yeah, it wouldn't work here all that kind of thing you get um, but if you talk to them about what they already do in their lives like this like you just did um, there might be a moment when they kind of think yeah why am I not doing that at work why am I not doing it that way and if they ask that question of themselves then you've got the beginning of a potential um, transformation there because they suddenly realize that there are better ways of working or you can conversely take their process that they're doing at work the sort of top-down people commanding and measuring and asking for you know uh, asking for um, tracking tracking everyone and assigning work to them and you ask them to say imagine you were doing that at home with your with your wife and your and your children and your and your and your neighbors how would that look and make a farce out of it you know and do it reverse it It'd be mad wouldn't it if you try to actually think about doing that we don't do that of course but um, it's just making that connection between what's natural to how we do creative things, which is most of what we do in the world is creative, and how we do that, and what we're doing in the workplace. And there's this massive disconnect at the moment. Yeah. None of us, none of us would ever um, assume to go out on a drive somewhere uh, and think that there's not going to be any problems along the way. Especially the longer the drive, the more likely there is to be problems, right? Uh, you can't predict exactly what time you're going to get somewhere and what route you're going to take. And we all know that. And so we allow for that. We allow extra time in case something goes wrong. Um, we use mapping devices that will advise us on roadblocks and traffic and give us alternative routes. Right. So um, when organizations talk about having a roadmap, they're not actually talking about a roadmap. They're talking about a road. They have one road, you know, and they have milestones along the road. Um, you would never plan a, a, a route that way. Your route planning would be a true roadmap because it's got many roads and it. it's a map of roads. That's what a roadmap should be, a map of roads, a map of alternatives. So we do this, right? We do this in our lives. And um, it would be great if people can start to get that and think, ah, oh, yeah, let's do that at work. And that's all I've got. So now we can... Uh, do some q and I suppose, or something like that. That's naked scrum, right? Start, you can start dressing it with new clothes. Strip it right down, take all the old stuff off and give it some new clothes. <laughs> um, all right, thank you, Tobias. Yeah. So if, if anyone has any any questions, we, we're gonna open it up to a little Q&A time here. You can either drop a note in the chat and I'll I'll read that to them or, or go ahead and just unmute yourself and ask. I like some of these comments that make me smile. Wedding retrospectives are not much use. <laughs> for the planning team, they are for the next wedding, because they don't, they're not invested, are they, in the way to, in the way that the customers are in that one? Yeah. How, here's a question. How is creative work different to knowledge work? I don't think it is. As Scrum is usually labeled as most suits. I don't think it is. I, uh, it's, it's this knowledge work, it's a very new term, isn't it? It's a new label we stuck on it. And it's uh, knowledge work, I think some people. It's a nominalization, that's what it is. Um, to, you know, to know is a verb and we've taken it and we call it knowledge and then we call it knowledge work. Uh, so we've made a noun out of it. Um, we can sell nouns, by the way, we can't sell adjectives and verbs, which is why it's so great to have the Agile Manifesto because now we can package it and sell it. So we can sell Agile. Whereas before you can't really sell agility. It's not really a thing you can sell. Um, so knowledge work is, is, is a bit of a nominalization, but it's, um, I think, you know, we talk about knowledge work thinking it's like working with, you know, data and information, and it's working in the information age, we have tons of information working with that. Um, but it's, I think knowledge work is part of, is a subset of creative work, if you like. It's working with Working with data is a creative act because it's new stuff all the time. What are we doing with it? We're, we're, you know, we're sorting it in some way and we're managing it in some way and we're presenting it in some way. Um, so I don't think there's a huge difference between those two things. Scrum is usually labeled as most suited to knowledge work. Scrum is, is labeled as most suited to complex work, isn't it? 
Um, and if we look at the Kinefin diagram or the Stacy diagram, the, the, the area where Scrum is supposedly effective is in that complex area, um, <clears throat> not in the complicated area and uh, not in the chaotic area either. So complex work is what is good. And most complex work just simply means, well, I think of it as, I think of work in two ways or two types is what I think of mechanical work and organic work. Mechanical work is work that has, we can make predictions about. It's a kind of um, if then approach. Like if I do this, then that will happen. And then if I do that, then that will happen. And you can map that out quite far ahead. But in, this is the, the key difference, right? Not, <laughs> Mechanical work is um, if, then, if this, then that. And knowledge and um, creative work, organic work, is if this, then what. So if this, then that is mechanical. If this, then what, as a question, is the organic, right? Because if this happens, what will happen next? We don't know, because we can't predict it. We have never done it before, so we can't map it in that way. We can ask that question though, and we can probe and, uh, and sense and, and try and determine the direction to go in and then get the feedback as quickly as we can so we can make the next decision. So we can ask the next, if this, then what question. So it's organic, right? So when you plant a tree seed, plant an acorn, you know it's going to grow into an oak tree, but it will only grow into an oak tree if you nurture the ground and take care of it. But you don't know exactly what the shape of the oak tree is going to be and you only have so much control over that and uh, the environment will help to determine what the shape of that tree is and whether it grows big or small or bent or straight um, so you know we can <coughs> we can nurture the oak tree but we can't predict its end point so that's the difference and i think knowledge work and is within that organic work mostly it's mostly within that uh, so we have uh, another question. Uh, what what should a scrum master do when a deviation from scrum helps the team deliver more value? Um, well, if you're doing this idea of naked scrum, then uh, I'm not sure what a deviation would be. A deviation from scrum, what would that mean? Can you can I have a more specific example on that, Clint? In the Philippines. You still here? I mean, when people talk about uh, not getting a response there, but if people talk about deviations, there's, there's two types essentially. There's um, a deviation because we think that having this particular event or having a backlog isn't going to be useful. So we kind of throw it away. Um, but there's adaptations like, well, maybe we don't have to meet every day for 15 minutes. I'm not even sure it says 15 minutes anymore. Maybe it does. Um, but the idea is we're, we're you know, we're, we want to meet regularly and we want to pause in our work and we want to have a ritual around what we're going to do next. Now, if you start throwing stuff like that away, you're weakening the structure, I think. So I would I would ask the question like in, in another way of doing things in my life, would I stop to reflect on a regular basis? You know, and the answer is usually yes. And so you say, well, don't don't deviate from that then. Um, but I, so I'm not really sure what the deviation means. Here. So, he, so he brought up not using a sprint goal, for example. Oh, uh, OK. Yeah, well, uh, it's very hard to find sprint goals sometimes. I understand that and I've struggled with it myself. It is very hard. But if we don't have goals, what are we working towards? It's It's kind of... To me, that would indicate that we're lost. If we can't set a goal for the end of the two week period that we're working, it would indicate that we're somewhere lost, right? Where we need to step back from that and say, what are we trying to do here? What's the big picture? Because we got caught up in the detail. This story, that story, you know, this backlog item, that fix, that, that bug. But why, why? What's, the goal is the why, isn't it? If we don't have a why, Talk to Simon Sinek about that. If you don't have a why, you can't really even get started. So, yeah, not having a sprint goal. I, I wouldn't say you should always have, a, you know, a really clear goal, but you want to be goal oriented. You got to have outcome oriented, right? You got to be outcome oriented. What's the outcome? Um, if you don't have the sense of an outcome, you're drifting a bit. 
So I think a lot of the times we think we shouldn't do something when we're doing Scrum is actually an indicator that we need to pause and consider what's going on. Now, what is this telling us? This desire for everyone not to bother with retrospectives, what's it telling us? It might be telling us that they all think they're so great that they never need to improve, bit of a worry. Uh, or they might think they're so crap they don't dare talk about it, also a bit of a worry. Um, so there's, there's reasons behind these um, decisions. So I wouldn't ever say you, you have to follow. It's not a rigid process, Scrum, anyway. It's a framework. It's a structure. And as we've just looked at, it's a structure based on some very natural things that human beings would do if they weren't doing Scrum. So let's bring those things into Scrum. Let's bring it into the work that we do. So you find that you kind of want to do most of that stuff. And when you don't, there's something a bit of a bit awry there. Got another question in there, Jamie. And this... Yes. Uh, so for the for the three accountabilities of Scrum, are each of these accountabilities necessarily do they have one person assigned acting out the accountability? Why or why not? Yeah, it's a bit vague, isn't it? It's a bit confusing that that role thing. Um, well, there's certainly, you know, a group of people who are, what I, they call them developers, I prefer the term maker. Um, but if I'm teaching Scrum, I'll say developer, because that's the term in the Scrum Guide. But well, there are people who are making stuff, right? So developer is a little bit specific to software, and we want to think of Scrum as useful for other areas as well. Um, so the people that are making the thing, uh, who've got the skills and the knowledge and the tools and the techniques uh, that they can do that. Uh, and then you've got the role of or the accountability of the product owner. Now, each Scrum team has a product owner accountability. But if you've got five teams, five Scrum teams working on one product, it wouldn't make any sense to have five different people fill those roles, one for each team, because you lose the, the, the um, pattern of having one product to one product owner, one product owner to one product. Right, product owner means they own the product. You have one voice, so it's all one voice. You might have multiple teams doing it. So in that case, the role of the accountability of product owner is filled by, the old habits die hard there with those language things. The accountability of product owner uh, must be one person across any number of teams that are working on the same product off the same backlog. So that would be one. The scrum master, um, I think that varies, you know, and like I said, in a very, broken dysfunctional organization, you may need one actual scrum master accountability in each team and it's a different person. Um, in some other organizations, you might only need one person who's doing a much more light touch job because the teams are truly self-organizing and self-managing and do the stuff they need to do for themselves. So then you have a lighter touch as a scrum master. So again, it, it's one of those things that varies. But I would suggest on the whole that the people who are the developers in a Scrum team are committed to that Scrum team. To have people moving about from team to team is not a bad model, but it requires a certain level of maturity, I think, in, in working in, in that kind of a way. Um, so at the beginning, you know, following the model of forming, storming, norming, performing, you, you, you get really great teams when they stay together and work together for a period of time, certainly not forever, um, but for some sub substantial period of time. And if people do move from one team to another, it's usually because they have a particular skill that's in short supply, um, or there isn't um, financial justification for having one of those on each team, you know, a, a usability person possibly, or an architect. Yeah. And those people, what they should be doing is um, helping all the other team members to learn the skill that they've got so they can do most of that work for themselves. So their job becomes a little bit more like a coach or, or educator when they jump from team to team. Does that answer that question? Maybe I can't see the person who wrote it on the screen. Yeah. Uh, so... So the next question is, organizations still label people as resources. Are humans resources, your thoughts? In a way we are. Um, I like to, uh, I like the idea of that if my neighbor is struggling with something that they can call on me as a resource to come and help them. So I don't, I don't, I'm not offended by that term. 
I don't like it in the, use, the way we use it in organizations, but I think there are worse terms we use. Um, FTE is worse to me, a full-time equivalent. It's worse than a resource. It's really dehumanizing language that is. Um, a colleague of mine likes to think of HR as being, um, well, I think of HR as being human relationship. I would like to think of HR as being concerned with human relationships. Um, but his, his idea is that we're not human resources, we are resourceful humans. I like that term, you know. We are resourceful and we can be called on to be resourceful. And so in that sense, we're being called on as resources um, for each other. But the idea that we are inanimate resources, and that's the implication, isn't it, when you talk about resources or FTEs, um, it's a sense, it's a very dehumanizing language. And I think any language that dehumanizes and, and, and loses the sense of the individual is to be challenged. It doesn't mean it's wrong. And I think that if we have an agreement about what we mean when we say resource, and we all share that agreement, it's not a bad word to use. It's a bad word to use when it is used um, to dehumanize people. So that's, any language is bad when it's used that way. And I think it, if we sense it, and that's a big one that always jumps out for people, we should challenge it. We should ask, you know, what is it you mean when you say resource? How do you see me? It's a good conversation. Yeah. And there yeah, we are. A lot of questions coming in. Yeah, if, if Naked Scrum is so logical and relatable, why are there so many conflicting views about Scrum? Because no one's doing Naked Scrum, they're all doing a decorated <laughs> You know, safe is a lovely example, isn't it? And there are other things as well of, of um, taking Scrum and just put more and more stuff around it, more and more roles and, you know, um, rules and all kinds of other things around it. Um, so it, it's it's so logical and relatable. I, 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 don't, I wouldn't even necessarily use the word logical. I suppose it is, but I, I, would, I think of it as being intuitive. See, that's the thing that attracted me to Scrum in the first place. Um, I was came to the, the corporate world quite late in my career and um, working in these processes that I was asked to work in was, was painful. And then when I came across the Scrum book and I read it, it just intuitively was right. I just knew it was right. That was the only way that we should really be working. It, it was just completely intuitive. So it wasn't even that it was logical. I suppose it was, um, but it was more about the intuition side of it. Like this just feels right something about this it just like, like yeah why would we not be, is that why would we not be doing this why are we not doing it um and of course then when i read it uh, i was like jumped on my evangelical soapbox and trying to preach to everyone else you know <laughs> not very wise that didn't work that well either um you have to bring people into this way of thinking gently don't you because it's intuitive to me it's not intuitive to everyone you know because we've learned so, because like I said, I came to this world quite late and I had lots of other experiences. But if you've grown up in this world and you've gone through university and, and you know, school, university, business school and MBAs and stuff and come straight into a management job, there's not, you don't know much else, right? So it's, it feels a bit brutal to start saying to people, well, all the stuff that you've learned is no longer valid because we're doing Scrum. That's a bit violent. And that's what I did, by the way. That's kind of my was my approach in the early days. It doesn't work though. There's lots of questions, isn't there? Um, Agile Manifesto says people overprocess. If a specific aspect of the Scrum process turns out to be an obstacle, experiment with alternatives. Yeah, this is interesting, isn't it? Um, I, I'll let's say this again, but I don't, I don't think, uh, and I don't, I'm not alone. In this Scrum isn't a process, right? Scrum is a framework. It's a set of boundary conditions. Um, that allows you to create a process. So the process that you create is your process. It is a scrum process, but it isn't the scrum process. It's a scrum process because it's a process that you have evolved within the boundaries of scrum. That's what it is. Um, and so if your process doesn't work, alter your process. But if your process doesn't work and, and you're, you're altering your process to start discarding some of the structure of Scrum, um, that might be the right thing to do, but you can't really be calling it Scrum. It's really quite simple. Scrum is defined by the two people who 
named it and wrote the scrum guide no one else gets to define it they do for what better or worse you know i'd love to love come up with new definitions of it and come up with my own scrum 3.0 or whatever um, but it's not really valuable to do that is it so I, I think the limitations of scrum are actually part of its power we we um operate most creatively within boundaries when we have limitations it's when we get really creative that's when the innovation happens when we're restricted not when we can do whatever we want so the idea of throwing stuff away there's a danger in that because you might be losing something really vital when you're doing that just because it feels a bit easier you know i think the temptation to say well let's do our own thing um, you it's really quite wise to pause for a minute and really sort of think about it and talk about it what why are we doing that you know what is it that we don't like about this and it might be just the way that someone else in your organization is choosing to implement scrum you know i'm making you follow it letter by letter or something like that the scrum guide needs to be followed in spirit um, there's very little you can actually do to follow it kind of word for word anyway you know but it's things like if it does say and i think it still does say a 15 minute end up a day you know i've, I've heard people arguing about this and say, what, what if it's only 14 minutes are we not doing scrum and it's just silly isn't it to get into that kind of debate the idea of 15 minutes means like don't have an hour meeting every day but keep it short um try not to go over 15 minutes but there must be times when you might need to but you know if you're going to get all really uptight about that it's a bit silly if you've got someone watching you then you've got dysfunction basically you've got some dysfunction there and uh, you need to address that um Yeah, people over process is a, a, one of the most important parts of the Agile Manifesto. And um, it's the people doing Scrum who should be making the Scrum process for their organization, or not even their organization, for their team, for their team and their associated stakeholders. You know, the, the, the process emerges and is the right process for that group of people. And if it isn't, then they need to step back and have a retrospective and talk about how they can improve it. That's the point of the retrospective, process improvement. Stefan, did that help? Uh, okay. Um, there's one here in a few places. What do you got? A few minutes left. In a few places, I've seen teams that only do API work or do platform upgrades, they don't want to do sprint review because they have nothing to show for people. What are your thoughts? My thoughts in that situation is that they're not doing Scrum because they don't have cross functional teams delivering value. Hello, sweetheart. <laughs> Deliver, they don't have um, cross functional teams delivering value at the end of each sprint. They have people handing off bits and pieces to each other. Uh, that's not Scrum, right? So step back from it right and say uh, well clearly what we're doing isn't scrum do we want to do scrum um and it sounds like in this particular case not really no we just want to carry on working the way we're working okay well let's carry on working the way we're working but why not periodically stop and reflect on what's working and what isn't working and that might be helpful might not it i think we can all benefit from that at any time um but you don't want to do sprint reviews so what does that mean you don't want to interact with your customers who is your customer? Or if a customer is another team, then you probably want to sit down and talk to the other team about the thing that you're handing off to them uh, and make sure that they like it and it's helpful for them, works for them. Because that's going to avoid a lot of anger and a lot of hurt and a lot of argument and a lot of disdain. So it's again, it's like, this is the process we've got. What you're describing there, some organization, that's what we're doing. If you were going in to try and impose um, all of the aspects of Scrum on that organization it probably will hurt. They're not ready for it, are they? So you work with what you've got. And I, you know, what I was advised of this, and I really like this. If anyone said, what's the first thing you do when you go in an organization? Uh, and I would like to really, really tell him about Scrum. He said, no, 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 no. He, said, he said, have a retrospective. That's the first thing you do is have a retrospective because they have been working together for weeks, months, years sometimes, right? So they've already got a process. Why not have them reflect on their process, look at what they like, look at what they don't like, and start from there. And I started doing that, and it's brilliant. 
you know, so I realized that, of course, of course, <laughs> again, it was like, intuitive. why would you not do that? Once I learned that, you can't really unlearn it, right? So, of course, um, we go in and, and do that. We, we learn. We get, that's how we learn, right? We learn what's going on in the organization. Uh, we learn what they like about their job and each other um, and the structure and the system. And we learn what is bugging them and what's blocking them, what's getting in their way. And then we help them to gradually kind of whittle that away, move through that. And it may be by doing sort of full on scrum, it might not be, quite often it isn't, you know, you're just working with the teams that are there, testing teams and design teams and helping them to integrate more, you know, and advising people to spend a little bit more time with each other. Why don't you spend a day with the testing team and see how they're testing the work that you gave them to do? Why don't you work with them after that? You know, why don't you sit and do some testing? And gradually it starts to, and then, you know, it could unfold into the scrum. So we've got to recognize, first of all, that, you know, the question is, are we, are we doing scrum, yes or no? It's very easy to determine that because there's a, a guide that tells you what it is. And if you're not, the question is, do we, want to, do we want to use this as our North Star and start working towards it? Or do we not want to do that? And if you don't want to do it, let's stop pretending we're doing it and stop, you know, calling people scrum masters and talking about, Stand up meetings, which is actually not a scrum term anyway, by the way. Uh, it's daily scrum is what we can call it a stand up meeting. So, you know, drop the scrum language if you're not doing scrum and uh, use language that's actually useful for what you're doing and actually helpful and actually mean something to the people doing the work. I'm so not into pushing scrum on people like that. I do think it's a really effective way of working and I do think it's a very natural way of working. Uh, and sometimes people are so caught up in unnatural ways of working that you have to gently help them shift from that if they want to shift. And not, not everyone does. Yeah, um, we're going to wrap up then. I think that's um, any thoughts on Alistair Coburn's Heart of Agile? Alistair Coburn is, uh, writes some amazing stuff. Um, I like his work a lot. Um, I haven't done that particular study with him, the heart of Agile. Well, I'm familiar, I've talked to him about it. And uh, we're very aligned in lots of ways about the work that we do. So, um, yeah, I see, I see Alistair Coburn as being a kind of um, an essential figure in the whole Agile movement, really, the, the shift and the manifesto. And, and in a way, I, I see that he, more than many of those early people, really has the spirit of this. Some of the others, I'm not so sure. You know, they, they contributed something great uh, and they all played their part in that. But some of them kind of carry the spirit of this. Um, James Coplain is another one. Uh, I think Ken Schwaber does. A lot of people would argue with me about that. <laughs> but, you know, it's just opinion, isn't it, really? The work that these guys did was great. But I would say, you know, if anyone said, should I read such and such a book by Alistair Coe? I'd say, yeah, probably, yeah, that would probably be good to read that. And no question for me, I'd like to show appreciation. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you, everyone. I think that we're about four minutes ready to close off, Jamie. Do you want to? Yeah, well, thank you, Tobias. Thank you so much for being with us um, today. Really, really appreciate your wisdom and sharing your thoughts. And, and also thanks, thanks to everyone who came today. Really great to see you, see you all here. And uh, again, I'll mention, um, uh, make sure you'll, I, I posted some links in chat, so you can scroll up to the chat, you'll see some links to uh, other Scrum Master of the Universe stuff. And again, um, we do have a survey, we'd love to hear from you. If you want a chance to win a, a autograph book from Jeff Fox, Team Mastery, why take a, take a moment to, to fill out our survey so we can continue to bring you great content. And again, Tobias, thank you, thank you, thank you. We really appreciate today. And, and your wisdom and your kindness. Thank you. That Thanks. was the first time I framed that talk as Naked Scrum, by the way. I've done bits and pieces of it, but I, the idea of taking all the clothes off is new. So I'm just nice I to like it. it. Yeah. Thank you for participating in that. Yeah, all right. I really like it. Thanks, everyone. And everyone have a great rest of your week. Thanks a lot. See Thank you on you, LinkedIn everyone. somewhere like that. All right. Bye, everyone. <laughs>